Yeah, so hi everyone and welcome to the second SNUFA seminar. Uh, today we've got two speakers, uh, Matteo and Manu. Um, each of them is going to give about a 20 minute talk. Um, there'll be time for questions after each talk and then time for like open discussion afterwards. Um, please keep yourselves muted during the talks, but feel free to post questions in the chat. And uh, yeah, I also have to let you know we're recording the session and uh, it'll be available to view on YouTube afterwards. Uh, yeah, so with that, I'll hand you over to Matteo for our first talk. Sure. Okay, so thank you everyone for being here and especially you, thank you Marcus for the invitation. It's very, very cool to have a, give a talk for the, some people of this NUFA community. So today, yeah, I'm going to talk about our, our recent work that I've done here in the lab that is based on optimization at the single neural level and how SDP can emerge from predictions. And I will try to give you my, uh, the, uh, yeah, to show you what do we mean with that, basically. So before that, I will just give a, yeah, like a why kind of thing, question that, yeah, if we look at data, what well, we see that there are, after the discovery of spec time independent plasticity in the end of the 90s, like you can see here in this picture, there have been several SDP rules that have been found that depend on many different types of the cell type, the, what the, the, the region of the brain. And that is not only SDP. So SDP is just one part of the actual huge, uh, is a part of a set of different learning rules that you can see in the brain that there is not only the homosynaptic plasticity, as I was saying, but SDP belongs to this group. You also have heterosynaptic plasticity. So changes, uh, you can see changes in synapses that are actually not activated by any presynaptic input itself. You can see homostasis that is more like a controlled feedback kind of thing. There is long, but also short-term plasticity, and there are others. So there is a, there are many different rules. And one could ask, well, like, what are those algorithms for, if there are algorithms? Like, so you can think about it more in a David Marr kind of way of thinking that you can ask, which is the computational level of, these, of those algorithms? And all those, those algorithms, especially SDP, they depend on spike timing. So indeed, if we think about temporal code, where you have precise spike times are what actually matters, it's not the rate, then we should expect to see in the, in the data some structural patterns of spikes, not only rates, for example, sequences. And this is indeed what we see. It's been, I mean, this, I think most of you that could be familiar with the sequence that you, we can see the hippocampus, or also there is this very nice work from uh, Hamburger et al. in 2019, where they have a uh, in vitro uh, cortex of the turtle. And by just eliciting one spike in one neuron, they can have reliable sequence that they just come just because they started with one pink, so in some neurons. So you do see spikes, sorry, sequences. You do see the, the structural patterns. And then there's also, how do we match these two things? Like all those algorithms, what are they useful for if you, we see all those sequences? And one idea is that that is basically the idea that we based our, our model on is based on predictive coding, which is of course a very broad topic. I'm not gonna get into detail what this means, but basically the idea is that predictions of your of the future of your input is what matters for the brain. Very broadly saying. And the, the point here is that if you have a tunable readout of those interspecs, in the, then you are, could be able, given those sequences, to learn the temporal and also predictive relationships within input. For example, to react faster or any other behavioral task. The idea is that you can see who comes first, who can predict the occurrence of the other, if you are able to read out the interspike interval. And that's our basic idea. We start with this hy hypothesis that prediction that I'm going to try to explain what we mean with prediction later, guides synaptic plasticity locally. And we base our model on free observation or assumption, if you want, it depends. So the encoding is local. So at the level of single neurons, you, you have this biological plausibility problem that you can only compute with the information that you have at the level of the cell. Encoding is limited. In this, and I'm going to show you what do we mean with limited. Encoding is costly. So there is a concept here of you want to optimize something to be better because otherwise you're just wasting energy basically. So let's start from the first two. So our model is a, one single neural model with very similar, if not equivalent to an integrated fire, leaky integrated fire model. 
So here I'm just in this quick time, a description. So where you have yeah, the leak and then you have some threshold, uh, sorry, so some reset given by the fact that you can spike and spike here just a heavy set function with some threshold of memory potential. And then you have your input. So if you, if you put it in a computation regret kind of thing, you can imagine the membrane voltage, you can interpret it as a temporal filter with some memory of what happened up to this time test. So you have some depolarization here now. This is the result of everything that happened in the past. And here you can see it as at every time step, you get the input now, then you, uh, you are scaling with your weights, and then you have the member voltage of the past, and eventually some spikes that happened in the previous time step. And here encoding is local in the sense that we are focusing on the member potential as the relevant variable for our computation in the sense that I, would just, that I just told you, this temporal filtering with some memory of the past. And encoding is limited in this sense that you cannot get depolarized forever up to infinite voltage, but you have some threshold. So you have to find the best way to encode what you need given the range of member depolarization that you can have. And then the last part, the code is costly. So that's where we end we, we insert the optimization problem that we can go back and more in the detail later. But the idea is that the loss, the, the, the objective of that one neuron is to reconstruct or predict, if you like, the input that is receiving at time step t, given the memory that it has of everything that happened before in the member potential at t minus one, and the, the weights that he has learned up to that one point. And here, that's how we add, we add this term in the computation graph. So uh, if, if we do this, then we can do just some graded descent and try to find out some learning rule. And here I'm already giving you the, the derivative. Without the derivation, that's the learning rule we get. In the line approximation, that means that we can actually now, the, also the weights get a subscript of time. You, we can adjust the, the synaptic weights recursively in time together with the dynamics of the member potential. And the learning rule is given by two terms that are where the major component is the prediction area, which is indeed the difference between the input now and what I can say about the input given what I saw up to the previous time step. And after this, now I'm going to try to show you what, if the neuron follows this learning rule, what it can happen when we train neurons to receive sequences of spikes. And I'm going to show you, and hopefully it will be an understandable way, that the, um, what happens is that the neuron learns to give credit to the input that they have some predictive power on the inputs or the other inputs that are going to come. Because if there is a, pre a previous input here has some predictive power, so I'm going to expect that the next input of the sequence, if the sequence is very reliable and structure, is going to come. So this gives me uh, predictive power for the future. And this, I'm going to enhance this input and suppress the other. But let's see it with our simulations. And let's imagine. One simple case in, where, in which we have a sequence of, in this case, we have 100 inputs that they're sending one spike per neuron in a time window of 150 milliseconds. And this is the sequence that the neuron sees. And then we train the neuron on this sequence repeatedly. And now I'm going to show you what happens to the synaptic weights and to the output, so the spiking activity of the neuron across learning. And what you see is that at the beginning, there's a bit of a messy thing. But then the more it sees the, 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 the sequence, the more it learns to give credit to input earlier and earlier along the sequence, because an input here is predictive of the of future inputs. But then the neuron learns that there are previous inputs that they can be predicted with those. And the convergent point is that it gives credit to the first input of the sequence, which, are, which is the unpredictable part of the sequence itself. The unpredictable part is the starting. You don't know when it starts, but when it starts, you know that the sequence is going to be this long and it's going to be those inputs. And this is the spike time of the neuron. As you can see, while the neuron is learning, also the, it's, got, it's changing where it fires. So it's, it's, it's uh, learning to represent input earlier and earlier in the sequence. And that's the convergence point. Then we can move a, bit, a little bit more on and say, okay, but that was a bit simple. like. Each one neuron spikes one neuron, uh, each one piece of neuron has one spike only, blah. So let's imagine that we have a pattern. So now I'm just computing here. I just, uh, it's a random pattern, homogeneous Poisson for 500 inputs in a time window of 100 milliseconds. 
This is in the not order case. If you then could take this pattern and you try to order as a sequence, that's what you see. So you will have something like that. And we train the neuron on this, and still, it's not a, uh, it doesn't depend on the how many inputs each one neuron is it's firing. It just depends really on the spike timing and the patterns that the sequence contains. And you see the same behavior. You see a decrease, uh, like a, it's going to learn to to give credit to the first input, and it's going to represent only the beginning of the sequence. And uh, this does not depend on initial condition, and it does not depend on the amount of inputs that you see. So here I'm showing you the loss across learning, how it changes for both these spike volleys here means the sequence. That's one, one spike per neuron that goes. And the spike pattern is what I told you before. And you can see independently of how many inputs there are or dependently of the initial conditions here, you can just go and the neuron learns to do that because it's a convergent point of the dynamics, that one solution. And what I want to say here that the neuron learns to represent the unpredictable part of the sequence, what we're also trying to, to see here is that what happens if this sequence is not a continuous sequence, but you have parts of sequence every now and then the input. And what you can see here is that the weights that the neuron is going to learn to represent input, first uh, components of the input for each subsequence that you have in the sequence. And here, what I'm showing you, this is just the firing rate computed in the in a time window of the, of the membrane time constant of the neuron, that, that is the relevant variable for this, of course, because that's what defines the memory of the neuron. And I, here, what, what does it mean is that there is an input here, and then you compute from, from each time step, you compute time, time window, time scales, uh, membrane time constant in the future, and then you compute how many inputs you have in this time window, and then you keep on going like that. So you are in the top, while you are at the very first input. Of the sequence. And, and these lines, uh, they represent where the neuron fires at the end of training. So as you can see, he learns to represent the beginning of each sequence. And of course, it is driven by learning. And now we are trying to compute, I'm not showing here this because it's still a work in progress, somehow try to estimate the capacity of the neuron based also on the, on the parameters that we're using. So how many subsequence the neuron can learn if, if the, the sequence they have overlapping synapses. This is work in progress. So I'm not going to show you because I don't have it <laughs> yet. So, uh, but yeah, that's basically the idea. So the important part here is that neurons learn to represent your predictable part of sequences. It doesn't depend on initial condition, doesn't depend on input. It just depends on the, if you want the spike density. So where there is a part of a sequence that has some spike, so it's dense, then the neuron can learn to, to to recognize the temporal relationships between the, that subsequence and represent the, the unpredictable part. Now I'm going to try to show you, like, yeah, cool, but like, which, which is the mechanism that the neuron can do that. And here, let's imagine, in order to do so, let's imagine a very simple proof of principle kind of thing when you have two inputs only. So you have a neuron, and there are two inputs. With uh, Here is at two milliseconds and four milliseconds, and there is so uh, delta t, a time window in the, between, sorry, of four milliseconds. And let's imagine that the neuron starts by having the first input subthreshold, then the second input uh, drives the neuron to fire. Across epochs, the, the neuron starts to, de to uh, decrease, so suppress this input and increase those in the first input, such that eventually he will learn to fire not for the second, because the second is predicted by the first, but it's gonna fire for only for the first. And here I'm showing just in this very simple case, starting from different initial conditions, what I want to show you here is that the importance of the output spike. Let's imagine we take this case. In this case, you have W1 and W2 are the synaptic weights for the first and second input. You see that if the neuron does not fire yet, the, both inputs are, uh, are um, symmetrically potentiated. But then as long as soon, sorry, as soon as the neuron starts firing, then you have this, this break of the symmetry, and then it's where the first input gets kicked in and gets maximized, and the second input gets minimized. And you can see it here for the output five times. And of course, even in the true input case, here I'm averaging over many different initial conditions, it doesn't matter. Whatever you start, 
you will end up with the first one maximally potentiated and the second one uh, uh, suppressed. And this you can also see it if you want in a parameter space analysis. So this is a convergent point. Wherever you start, you're going to end up there. And here I'm going to go to the last part that is the relation with STDP. And I'm trying to, I hope I'm going to make my point clear enough. So let's imagine that we are here in this parameter space. If we start from this initial condition, you will have both potentiation and then at some point the neuron will start firing and then you have this break of symmetry. But let, let's imagine that we are here or somewhere there. You can see that the dynamics in the parameter space, so the way that the, the synaptic weights change depends from where you are and depends on the, uh, yeah, if you're spiking or not. But let's imagine that we are here. Here it means that there is the second input that is firing that is, sorry, the second input is the one that triggers a spike, and the first input doesn't. This reminds us of STDP protocols, where you have a pre-post pairing, where you have a pre and then a post, and if the pre comes before the post, they have potentiation, and the other way around, you have depotentiation in the classical. So we wonder, what happens if we just use the same input protocol, the simple one, true inputs, one uh, two milliseconds and one four, and then six in that case, but we just see how the, how the learning changes if we increase or decrease the delta t between the inputs as the people does in SDP to, to compute the learning group. This is important because if you think about it, SDP somehow is a specific component of the gradient. So it is a, a temporal filter of derivatives. If you think about it, that your model, your system is a recursive system, a recursive system that indeed has the, some hidden activity that gets into uh, plug into the next time step, it will have a recursive gradient. And if the system is stable, it would be uh, this recursive gradient will depend on the uh, yeah, Jacobian or whatever the the way that the 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 activity of the of the system itself gets recursively updated. And if the system is stable, you gain component of the gradient. And this is basically somehow, if you want, STDP. You can see some references. And the point is that though, if this is the case, then why the effective delta W has to be always anti-symmetrical? And, and if, the, if we are using this uh, comparison with the optimization, if the output is a discrete spike or not spike, what, how can the input be penalized? if the gradient has been already propagated through the fact that the spike happened. So how can you have the post pre depotentiation? And, of, and also we can see that as we saw also before, SDP depends on many other different things. And especially it, it can also, you can also have plasticity even without output spikes. So all of these questions and this way of trying to address SDP in a more gradient descent kind of idea, led us to indeed, as I told you, see how the, the how our weights will change if we use a, a true input sequence and then we just change the delta t between the inputs. And what we did, we did exactly that. And we see something like a SDP. So basically, if you have true inputs that they come, this of course, we are constraining the input in a way that in this case is the second input that is triggered the spike. And in this case, it's the first input that is triggering the spike. But if you constrain that, you can see that it's just a matter of the parameters that you're using and the initial condition where you are, you can get something like SDP with this dependence with the time delay. But also, depending on where you are in the parameter space, you can have some different SDP rules. So you don't only have this necessarily this one. It really depends from where you are. So in this case, uh, these are not so cool examples, but you can have the uh, completely LT LTP-based uh, SDP, or you can have completely LTD. I'm not showing here right now, but we also have some cases which you can have the opposite of that. So you can have the anti urban It really depends from where you are. And on top of that, what we try to show is that we can also reproduce not the classical, not only the classical SDP free post pairing, but some more nonlinear SDP, as they call it. So the dependence of SDP on other factors, that is not only the pre-post. 
in this case here you can see how SDP, how plasticity in general depends on the when you instead of having a pre-post you have a pre and free posts and you just change the the frequency of these postsynaptic bursts and what they see in the data is that if you increase the frequency of the bursts you can increase LTP but you don't change LTP and we can reproduce this in, the, in our model. We can also reproduce the crazy shift that you have. There are several papers that this is very interesting. How SDP depends on the frequency of pairing. That of course makes sense that when you increase the frequency of pairing, so you are decreasing the time window between one pre-post and the other one. If you if you decrease it enough, then the, the second one of one repetition can become the first for the for the next repetition. So you're just gonna uh merge true repetitions together so you what you can see is that you can turn ltd into ltp for high enough frequency of pairing and that's what we can see in our model and for instance we, we can see that a post pre that will lead to ltd can turn can be turned into a ltp if you then add enough spikes later on so it's a post pre post 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 the more you increase the spikes, the more you can turn LTD to LTP. So basically, the main argument here is that you don't need necessarily to hard code SDP in your rules, in your model. It could actually be that SDP is just a is a cross section of a more complicated learning rule, and you see SDP for specific cases, and you see another type of SDP for other specific cases. But they are not necessarily different mechanisms. They can belong to the same underlying rule that in our case we would propose that is based on predictions and yeah for, with this i'm done so i want to thank you everybody for listening to me we have a preprint out many things changed but you can see some some stuff that i talked about here as well and yeah then i'm just open for questions and everything thanks a lot man really cool <laughs> thanks a lot for the talk Matteo. Um, if anyone has a quick question, maybe we could do that and then uh, we'll get on to Manu. Yeah, I, just quickly. So you you, you mentioned um, like this, the learning rule came about from, you know, you, you started with a loss function that you assumed, okay, let's assume that the neuron is trying to predict kind of the future. And then and then you get a, you got a weight update that came out of the, de the, the derivation of that, right? But so then, so the, the different shapes of the STDP, they come about only by based on your initial weights. Not they're not based on anything to do with the loss function itself. Like the, the you know you showed us the symmetrical the the, the asymmetrical STDP, the symmetrical the LTD, different all these variants. Right. The, these are purely function of your initial weights. Yeah, and eventually of the parameters that, that you use in the model, that they're basically true in our in our model, given that it's basically a leak integrating fire. We have only two parameters that is the member time constant and the threshold so uh -huh. depending on where you put your member your threshold and your member time constant and depending from where you start in the permit space that's what you can get yes but it doesn't do it's always the same loss if there was a question yeah right yeah yeah exactly cool well lots of stuff to discuss afterwards um with that i'd like to introduce our next speaker oh oh manu do you have a quick question no no go for it go for it go for it well, no, no, go for it, please. Uh, so, yeah, Mate, uh, I might have missed this, but does, does this uh, neuron after learning, does it respond more to unpredictable stimuli or stimuli that were not expected? If, if there's like uh, prediction, predictive coding, or is the idea that like unpre unpredictable stimuli uh, evoke more higher responses, right? That, does that actually come out of? This so yeah thank you for the question of course this is very interesting because you know indeed predictive coding ex sort of as expects is this a, a prediction of predictive coding yeah, it's a bit of a problem whatever uh but the um, but it, it really depends on the actual context that you have so this is a very general idea that makes sense and i could tell you yes why in our case it works because if the environment of the neuron is the low sequence then the inputs that are later are the predictable inputs and the first input of the sequence is the unpredictable input 
So he just fired for the first. And he doesn't represent the other ones because they're already predicted. So if you imagine it that way, that's the environment of the neuron. He just receives pings from all over. And that, yeah, that means that we have, we, we actually have what predictive volume would have. But of course, it, this has to be, you know, contextualized of what you're having and the specific, yeah, type of input, inputs that you have. But yeah. Thanks. Cool. Um, with that, if uh, Manu, would you like to share your slides as well? Mm -hmm. Yes. And, uh, for anyone who's interested, I put a link to Matteo's preprint in the chat. Mm -hmm. Great. So uh, uh, yeah, on to our second speaker, which is Manu. Yes. Um, can everyone see my screen and hear me? All good. Yep. Thank you. So. Okay, I'm just going to start. Uh, thanks for joining everybody and uh, thanks Marcus for the chance to present here. Uh, this is a quick introduction. I'm a PhD student with uh, Friedrich Manzenke at the Friedrich Michel Institute in Basel. And uh, my PhD work is about biologically plausible unsupervised learning objectives and plasticity roles. And I'm looking forward to discuss some of this work with all of you today. So at a high level, the motivation for my project is just this simple observation that natural visual input is a stream of images, like this little dog running around here, and represented as vectors in the activities of sensory input neurons. This sequence of stimuli would define some high-dimensional nonlinear manifold. And after some time, suppose we see a cat running around, and then this would define another manifold and so on. So in raw sensory input space, this define, these uh, manifolds are usually highly entangled in a nonlinear way. But we know that in the cortex, specifically the inferotemporal cortex, uh, neural, neural activities are, are actually disentangled and object categories can actually be uh, linearly decoded. But how does the brain learn such disentangled representations in the first place? Right. Uh, so when we zoom into the brain, the ventral visual stream that extracts object representations is consisting of hierarchically connected populations of neurons. And we can approximate them to some extent by structure of deep conf confidence. Uh, but the reason why we look at this is that they've been empirically very successful at this problem of representation learning. And the process by which they learn can start to shed some light on how the brain might be doing this in the first place. But the usual way of training deep nets is with explicit and detailed supervision, like supervised learning. It's not likely to be present in biology. So the question is more about how these representations could be learned in an unsupervised way just by exposure to data from the world. So in our work, we look at whether the learning by prediction could be a viable strategy for the brain to do this kind of unsupervised learning of disentangled representations. And uh, this strategy is based on the observation that inputs that occur close together in time are likely to be corresponding to the same underlying object, even if viewing conditions are changing or if the, if the object is moving around uh, and so on. So intuitively then what we could do is to pull together represent in neural space the representations of those stimuli that are happening close together in time. So this pulling together is happening in the space of network outputs in terms of an ANN or in the cortex in terms of the brain. So basically we're asking neuronal activities to be good predictors of future activities so that they become invariant to small changes like viewing conditions or motion uh, and only sensitive to features of the input that remain invariant or constant over time, like object identity. Of course, this idea is closely related to predictive processing models of the brain that suggest the brain is constantly making these sorts of predictions of its own future activity. And we're here trying to look at the idea that errors in these predictions could be useful for learning. Turns out that this idea, this principle, has actually been successfully applied in the uh, by the machine learning community in 
in terms of these models called self-supervised learning models. And these are basically based on the same strategy, uh, but they also use something called contrastive objectives, but I'll touch upon it towards the end. So we can now formalize a bit this idea of predictive learning as optimizing the objective of minimizing prediction errors in the space of neuron outputs. This is a bit different from the objective that Matteo just talked about, which is optimizing prediction errors of its inputs. So we are here optimizing the prediction errors in, the, in, in terms of the output of the neuron. The problem with this is that such predictive learning by itself has a degenerate solution where the network could just cheat and have constant output. And if it has a constant output, it obviously has a, a zero prediction error, perfectly minimized. And uh, the constant output is perfectly predictable, but it's also perfectly useless as a representation. So we need a mechanism to prevent such a representational collapse. And what this mechanism would need to do is to push apart representations of stimuli that are far separated in time and not allowed to be the same sort of variance maximization constraint. The cool thing is one of uh, the most well-known computational models of synaptic plasticity that we probably all know about is well suited to achieve this kind of variance maximizing effect. And I'm talking here about heavy plasticity. And to see why, here's a sketch of uh, the finished of Cooper Munro plasticity rule, uh, which is one uh, a, a stable heavy and learning rule. And here the idea is that there's a mean dependent learning threshold and all the inputs that all the inputs that evoke uh, represent evoke outputs that are higher than the learning threshold gets pushed further up. And all inputs that are lower than the threshold get pushed further down, undergoing LTD. And so by definition, the output of the neuron is not allowed, is driven far and far away from the center of the output activity space. And by definition, collapse is avoided. So with all this in mind, we came up with simple plasticity rule, uh, LPL rule for latent predictive learning. And uh, as usual, there's a uh, learning rate eta, the presynaptic input x, Nonlinearity, uh, actually the derivative of the nonlinearity at prime. And uh, this term, the second term here, is almost exactly the BCM rule, except we use the mean output Z bar directly without a nonlinearity as the learning threshold. And there's also this weighting by the variance of the output activity, which basically turns off heavy learning when there's enough variance, basically, when uh, the output activities are separated enough that it's no longer necessary to have this push effect. And the predictive, the predictive uh, term, for example, here is the term that actually says the activities that occur close together in time should be similar enough so that the activity doesn't change very really fast. So this is what really implements the full effect. In, in a sense, this uh, plasticity rule is an extension of PCM theory with the realistic neuronal transfer function like we plotted here. The learning rule looks exactly like BCM with a, with a threshold that moves around depending on the mean activity of the neuron, uh, Z bar. And, but now the predictive term, the rate of change, uh, gives an additional independent mechanism to move the learning threshold around. And also this variance dependence, which shuts off heavy learning when there's enough variance by changing the shape of the plasticity. Let's see now what this neuron, uh, what this learning rule does in practice. For this, we looked at a very simple setting with a rate neuron that just has two inputs. And the input stimuli come from two clusters that are separated in the x direction. If an in and the sequence of inputs is such that if a given input comes from one cluster, then the input at the next time step is very likely to come from the same cluster. Occasionally, there are jumps, but these are very rare. So, and the y direction is just defined as a noise direction with consecutive samples that just drawn from a Gaussian distribution with different amounts of standard deviations, sigma y. And uh, overall, this means that the, sorry, 
Overall, this means that the X input is the slow or predictable feature because consecutive stimuli have high probability of it having the same value of X, whereas the Y input is completely unpredictable noise. So what does this neuron learn under different learning roles? Uh, here we plotted the selectivity of the neuron to the X direction, which is the predictable stimulus, as a function of different noise levels. So what would a heavy learning rule like OYA's rule, for example, learn? Uh, uh, so at low, at, uh, OYA's, OYA's learning rule typically uh, picks up, is known to pick up the highest variance principal component. And at low values of sigma y, low values of noise, that's just the x direction. But this switches over to the y direction, to the noise direction at high values of sigma y. That's exactly what OYA's rule does. It's selective to X at low noise levels and selective to Y at high noise levels. And uh, the same thing is true of our learning rule when we just have the heavy term of our learning rule active and the predict without the predictive term. But when we actually have the predictive term in the learning rule, the neuron always becomes selective to X regardless of how much noise it is. Of course, the heavy learning rule, we included this in the first place because it was necessary to avoid collapse. And we see exactly that's what happens when we exclude the heavy term now. Uh, when, when the heavy term is not there, activity quickly goes to zero, which obviously we would want to avoid. So both terms of this learning rule are important. So we just saw that for a single neuron, what it does, learn slow features of its inputs. But before we move on to apply this to a network, let's take a step back and, uh, at the, and take another look at the learning rule. We had this predictive term, just predictive learning leads to collapse. We added a heavy term, uh, which avoids uh, to avoid representational collapse. This is completely fine for a single neuron, but when we have multiple neurons, there can be a different kind of collapse called dimensional collapse, where each neuron isn't really collapsed to zero activity, but they essentially learn the same feature. They have completely correlated activities. This is not collapsed per se, but it's losing a lot of the representational capacity of the population, especially when we have multiple neurons in the population and multiple populations that are hierarchically connected. So, in, so we add an additional term to our learning rule that decorrelates the activity of different neurons. And in ALM terms, it's basically saying that all the units in a single layer should learn different features. Of course, this means this term is not anymore neuron local. It's not local to a single neuron, but it, it is local to the population. But it's not local because it needs to know the activity of every other neuron in the population. But there are a lot of models that do show that a similar decorrelation effect can be achieved through lateral inhibition and inhibitory plasticity. And uh, incorporating this into a model needs a lot more work, but it's definitely something we're interested in looking at. For now, we stick with this decorrelation term and use the, we use the learning rule to train deep confinement on image inputs from the STL10 data set. We generated input sequences artificially by taking a single image and applying different image transformations like cropping, uh, change, uh, messing with the color, create, uh, blurring, etc. And this is the usual strategy followed in machine learning these days for self-supervised learning. And we can think of these roughly as consecutive input stimuli under changes in lighting, translation, etc. So with exposure to these inputs, we train each layer of a confinement independently without backpropagation. So it's really a layer local learning. And uh, we found that layer local learning with this learning group manages to train the network to find good representations. And by good, I mean, uh, we can decode object category with a fairly high linear readout ac accuracy of uh, 62% after unsupervised training. Uh, we use layer local learning to stress that this actually works as a learning rule and can stack up, but we can also optimize the same underlying objective in an end-to-end -end way. Uh, using backprop, and this gives much higher uh, linear readouts. We also see that turning off any of these three terms in the learning row uh, 
leads to really poor linear readouts. And uh, uh, to see in more detail what's going on, we looked at, we evaluated the linear readout at every intermediate layer instead of just at the output layer. And then we see that with, with the full learning row, the features get progressively more disentangled. So linear readout progressively increases with depth, but this is not true with any of the three terms turned off. Uh, heavy learning, the case of purely, uh, the case of uh, purely heavy learning with the predictive term removed is interesting because it manages, it seems to manage to train the early layers to some extent, but then stacking this up further leads to poor performance. Uh, people have been trying to stack up heavy learning rules for a long time, and it hasn't shown a lot of success as far as I know, and this starts to give an idea of why that might be the case. And again, as before, uh, the heavy term is super important for sure because it avoids collapse, and then that's exactly what we see again in the activity levels. Without the heavy term, activity just goes to zero across all the years. And, uh, but again, uh, now to the decorrelation term that we just added, we saw that without the decorrelation term, also there's poor performance, but this is not really because of collapsed activity. So there is non-zero activity in all layers, but what's, it, what's actually happening, we see, we, uh, we find out when we look at the dimensionality of the representations, we measure this using participation ratio, but essentially we see that the, without the decorrelation term, the dimensionality of the representations just goes to one. So really this picture of all neuronal activities just being, uh, just varying along a single line is actually what is happening without it. So it, it is actually important. So this kind of predictive learning seems to be surprisingly effective and our learning group is quite, we're quite excited about it, but for, as for experimental evidence, there's a lot of support, long-standing support for heavy end plasticity, but is there any evidence for predictive learning? Turns out that an unsupervised visual learning experiment in monkeys does show uh, some good experimental support. So what they did in this experiment was uh, monkeys would be exposed to specific visual sequences. Uh, basically the animal is staring at blank screen initially, and then uh, they would present an object at random, either above or below its center of gaze. And then once these objects are presented, the monkey automatically circates to these uh, objects by reflex. The interesting thing they did was at one position here below, they kept the object identity constant over time. But and in, at the other position, what they did was during the saccade was happening, while the saccade was happening, they switched the object out into a different, into a completely different one. So they create, in essence, they created a, an incorrect temporal association between one object at a specific peripheral position with another completely different object at the center of case. So then the idea would be that the monkey learns to, over time learns to associate object P in the periphery with object N in center of case. And uh, so that the selectivity between the objects at that specific position would go down. So this object specific and location specific change in selectivity between the, between the pairs of objects could be quite clearly seen in electrophysiological uh, recordings from the IT. And, and this was really specific to this to the position where the swap was happening and to the objects that were being swapped. So this effect was not present for sets of control objects that were not uh, manipulated in this manner. And uh, we modeled this experiment in simulation using our deep CNN trained on STL images. And we were able to reproduce many of the key experimental observations. Uh, and also while learning was happening just according to our learning group. Uh, so, all, all, and when we look deeper, the change in selectivity is both because response to an initially preferred of stimulus was going down and 
response to an initially non-preferred stimulus was going up. Uh, so this was, which was also what was observed in this experiment. So before concluding, I, I do want to quickly point out that this kind of variance regularization idea for avoiding collapse where uh, neuron activities are pushed away from the mean activity level was actually inspired by uh, recent work in SSO from uh, Jan Kuhn and Adrian Bad and Jim Pong. And uh, they use this very similar learning objective, but in a different mathematical form. Also, it's important to note that this variance regularization is not usually how collapse is avoided in self-supervised deep learning. Usually what is done is instead of maximizing distance to the mean activity, what is maximized is pairwise distances between uh, stimuli like Z1 and the ZN. But this approach usually gives better performance overall, but it's not really biologically plausible. And to see why, let's go back to this picture we had of input stimuli, where for some moments we see object one, after some time, after a few minutes, we see object two. And this negative sample strategy would mean that the brain would need to store detailed activity levels about, uh, about its responses like a few minutes ago and use that information to uh, drive plasticity at the present moment. So there is some work that tries to reconcile this implausibility with biology using three-factor learning rules, but the approach we, we propose using variance regularization is conceptually simpler and basically says each neuron just needs to keep a running estimate of its mean activity in order to calculate its weight updates. So in summary, we proposed a new learning tool based on predictive learning, which combines a predictive pull uh, force with heavy and push term, it draw, which draws a surprising link to BCM theory, actually. This was not really obvious to us at the start. Uh, it learns slow features of its inputs in a single neuron, and it stacks up in a deep network with some uh, modifications, of course, and it captures unsupervised learning in monkey IT. And obviously there are lots of limitations with the way we do things currently. Uh, the most important one I already mentioned is this artificial way of, uh, of enforcing deep correlated activity. And we are also actively working on extending this to spiking neuron models and network models, which would have been more uh, appropriate for a SNUFA audience, but hopefully we can talk about this soon. We have some preliminary results, but I haven't presented it today. And uh, one thing that we've seen is that it needs careful tuning of the time constants of learning and different terms in the learning group. And hopefully I'll talk more about this some, uh, sometime soon. And also we're looking at rigorously comparing the representations learned in our network to in, in vivo data. And uh, thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, so I would also like to thank everybody in the Sanke lab. And if you thought this, was interesting to check out our preprint. Um, yeah, that's perfect. And I'll be happy to take questions now. <laughs> Some of this was clear. Very good. Well, thanks very much for the awesome talk. Um, I'm sure there's lots of questions, but maybe I'll just jump in first. Um, so actually picking up on your last point with comparing to in vivo data, um, mm -hmm. I was wondering, I mean, I realize it's like quite a different task and it's difficult but like have you thought about trying to uh i guess you've seen brain score the james de carlo thing uh yes exactly that that is what uh, we would like to do now i mean i'm still trying to figure out how this works and uh what i did try as a first approximation was uh just look at the rdms the representational dissimilarity matrices there is some structure but it's not completely clear i think and uh uh, brain score is definitely something that we will be trying to cool no that's great i mean also being biased coming from sniffer <laughs> i'd love to see a spiking network uh come yeah. top on brain score that would be <laughs> nice but mm. you know, yeah. also one thing to note here though is that although this specific model we haven't tried out on brain score but i think dan yamins has showed that uh, Self-supervised learning models, I think based on a different one called 
uh, contrastive predictive coding, I think. Uh, and they showed that uh, the representations of those networks are actually better than uh, networks that were trained with supervision. So, I mean, that's, that's cool. I missed that. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool to hear. Um, yeah, well, I'll let anyone else uh, take over with questions. So. Uh, I will have a question, I think. Yes. So, yeah, but I have to ask you, I think I'm sorry to share your slides again. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, just a moment. Yeah, yeah, sure. It, it, it's about the, the very first result that you showed, the one with the single neuron. It's just mm. that I, I missed a bit. Uh, yeah, probably I didn't get it. But what do you mean with selectivity? When you show the selectivity, how does it change? What is the selectivity uh, in, your, in your neuron? Here, right? So selectivity here, we use a very rough oh, wait, I, I don't see uh, the, the, are you oh. sharing? Oops. Yes, I have to share. It's complicated. Okay, there. I mean, if you want, yeah, okay. No, no, no. First, there we go. I think it's easier this way. Do you see it? No? Yes? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I see it. Exactly. Uh, wait a sec. Yeah, this one, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. So we, we use a very simple measure. Basically, it's the difference between the output of the neuron to neurons from one cluster and the uh, in, in, sorry inputs from one cluster and inputs from the other cluster. Just the difference in response, and normalized by I think the standard deviation of its overall response. Okay, so, I see. I see. So it is right. So it, uh, X, it, okay, I see. So it means that it's high, it has higher activity for the X inputs. So no, it's, yeah. uh, it means that, uh, so when it's zero, that means that the neuron has the same response to inputs regardless of which cluster it's Right, from. right, right. Whereas a high selectivity means that there is a difference in the response. So it, I think it's absolute difference in output normalized by uh, overall activity levels. Okay, I see. So this means that this neuron is sensitive to the air. I mean, it's a, it's a different way of saying that the weight for X is high and the weight for Y is low. Right. Yeah, thanks. Questions? Super clear talk, I guess. <laughs> oh, everything was really well explained, Manny. So. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> it's super clear. Yeah, I'm definitely excited to check out the paper. It's been on my reading list for an embarrassingly <laughs> long time. <laughs> so, yeah. So, but the one thing I, I did find curious with, I don't know if anybody has questions, please jump in, but or talk about it, if you have a free discussion. One thing I found curious with, with, like what you said, Matteo, was that the neuron becomes sensitive to unpredictable stimuli, whereas, whereas the whole basis for my idea is that it should only be sensitive to predictable features, right? So. I don't know what, what do you think about this? Yeah, it's very, very, it's very interesting. I think that like, I think that there is no much consensus somehow also in general, what, what do we think like, well, we are, I think predictive coding is a bit too broad sometimes, at least mm -hmm. to my understanding. There are so many ways you can interpret it. It's very general that this can be a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing, especially if you try to apply it to something specific. For instance, I could tell you that, did you see my, um, I, I've shown that 
if I have a sequence with different subsequences, then the neuron can learn. Then the neuron can learn to um, spike for the beginning of each one subsequence, right? And these actually I don't see so different from yours. It's more like a if you want, it's like a slow feature analysis anyway. Yeah, because that one short sequence can mean could mean cut here, cut here, cut here, cut here, cut here, but still cat. And the other one could be dog here, dog there, dog there, but still dog. Yeah. Right? And the, the neuron is learning to, I don't need to, in order to, in my way would be because I want to fire as fast as possible and I want to just give credit to what I really need. It's the beginning of the sequence and I don't need the rest because the rest is given. Mm -hmm. But we end up with similar results. Although yeah. from your side, you see what I mean? Like, I, I don't know how to reply to, <laughs> to that. <laughs> it's a, I think it's a very... It's very interesting, but still, uh, mm. I think it's a bit grounded on the problem that it's too general sometimes. Yeah. But indeed, I see mm, interesting stuff to be discussed about on that. Something I always wondered, Manny, was uh, in, I mean, as far as I understand, with self supervised learning, it's usually that you have essentially parallel networks and then you want each network the cross-correlation of the like output layers to be kind of uh, similar, right? Um, yeah. With your networks, you're basically, you're trying to, no, because you have two parallel networks and then, but you're basically comparing it every layer. Is that right? Because it's the predictions. Maybe I'm confused. Yes, exactly. So the two parallel networks are usually actually the same network, except like sometimes there's an asymmetry added on top, but, in, in a sense, it's a Siamese architecture. And uh, yeah, you're right. Like in our, in our layer local setting, that's what we do. We just we just compare across layers only. So cont layer one, the output of it is compared to cont layer one's output for the other input. Basically. Cool, thanks. But uh, yeah, the, uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff. I mean, SS, SSL is, at the end of the day, it is doing SFA. Just they managed to do it in a differentiable way, such so that the deep net can actually learn something useful out of it. But uh, yeah, it, it just it needed some specific kinds of tricks to make it work. Yeah, I was reading the Barlow twins paper, the redundancy reduction, um, which is really cool. I guess no, quite different to your decorrelation. No, no, it's actually. I even heard that. Uh, so the model I started with, uh, Bikrek, so what I talked about at the end, which does various regularization, was I think rejected because it was too similar to Barlow twins. It's, it's actually <laughs> almost an extension of that work. They also had a decorrelation um, um, objective sitting there. Right. Yeah, to prevent the collapse as well. Right. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. Another paper which I keep skimming, but have still yet to read <laughs> in detail. So. Cool. Well, I mean, I, unless anyone else has anything else to say, I think we could wrap up. And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. thanks for both giving great talks, guys. Um, they'll be on YouTube if you want to share them with anyone. And thanks to everyone for questions. And uh, yeah, we've got two speakers for next month, um, first Wednesday of next month. So see everyone then. Awesome. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. Bye.